coming uh, this afternoon uh, to hear this uh, Dean's Lecture Series presentation by Professor Paul O. Uh, Paul was promoted to full professor uh, about a year ago, and as part of his promotion, uh, this uh, seminar is being presented uh, to talk about the work that he has done uh, while, his, uh, while here at Drexel. A quick uh, background on Paul. Um, as I've already told you, he's a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. He did his BS at McGill University and his PhD at Columbia. He's won a number of honors, for, uh, including from the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, the Naval Research Lab, he's an NSF Career Award winner, uh, among others. Uh, Paul has served in a number of capacities uh, at Drexel University. Most recently, uh, in, in, uh, he has been uh, leading our DARPA Robotics Challenge, which has been an incredibly successful project, uh, and uh, was featured uh, actually at the last board meeting where Paul put on a heck of a show. Um, Paul will be talking today about his work in robotics, um, and uh, uh, I will turn it over to Paul, hoping that we will have a chance for some questions and answers at the end. Okay, thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, Dean Hughes. And, uh, you know, it's not often that I get an opportunity to, to speak to the college. And so before I actually begin the talk, I just wanted to, you know, lift up a prayer for all of us here and uh, just to share in the blessing. Uh, Heavenly Father, you are God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we thank you and welcome your presence here on our campuses, in our neighborhoods, in our city. Lord, I pray for a fresh anointing upon our administration. I pray for your insight and wisdom um, upon our faculty, and that anointing spills over to our students and into their neighborhoods. May they carry a light into a city that will shine and infect their nation and the world. We lift this up in your name. Amen. Okay. Again, thank you all for taking your afternoon uh, to spend with me. I know we have a very busy academic time. But uh, it truly is uh, an honor to be able to come and, and share some of the, the work that has been done um, in robotics here at Drexel. And I decided to call this talk uh, Passing the Tipping Point. Okay? Um, this is something that comes out of uh, the President's Office of Science and Technology Policy. And it talks about disruption and transformative research. And one way of thinking about transformative research is things that lead to um, new products or new services. And it was only recently uh, that robotics was identified as a priority. And for the first time in the US, in US history, it's entered into the fiscal budget. Uh, and that's great news. Uh, but it also comes on the coattails of both Asia and Europe that have seen robotics as an economic engine uh, and have been doing so over the last uh, a decade, possibly even two decades. Okay, so it's good that we're finally here and this memo that was issued out said that we're nearing a tipping point and I hopefully you're, you will agree with me that we've already hit the tipping point. Okay. So uh, I think uh, you know, some people see robotics, you know, they called it the three Ds, dull, dirty, and dangerous. And I really call that yesterday's view. Uh, not to say that it's not relevant anymore. Uh, indeed, we are seeing robotics continue to have impact in manufacturing, in, uh, you know, search and rescue, humanitarian assistance. And of course, you know, you could buy these things for, for cleaning and carpeting or, you know, uh, vacuum cleaning. Um, I would say that perhaps about maybe almost a decade ago, we started to see a second wave, um, and we see a much broader role of robotics beyond dirty, dull, and dangerous, and this is just kind of a listing. Uh, we could start to see more and more robots in surgery rooms. Uh, another big driver is on aging population and using robotics for assistive technologies. We are also seeing robotics engage those that um, are, are suffering with uh, social orders, for example, autism or Parkinson's disease. We're beginning to see something. So I called that the second wave. Okay. Now, 
you might also be familiar that Bill Gates in 2006, uh, in the cover story of Scientific American, uh, said that uh, robotics will be in the household, much like PCs are in the household. And this is also President Obama. He was at Carnegie Mellon when he kicked off uh, the NRI, or the National Robotics Initiative. Um, and I say that the third wave is here, and one quote that Bill Gates had was, it's the next big thing after mobile. Okay? And these are just some of the things that we're seeing in 2012. For example, Amazon had uh, bought out Kiva Systems for logistics delivery, uh, and that, that really hit uh, you know, the, uh, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the Google car, some of you might know with the driverless technologies, they have already logged over 300,000 miles. And the Da Vinci system um, that is in over a thousand different hospitals uh, worldwide has uh, done a, a lot of surgeries. So the thing that I'm trying to figure out, and, and why I call it the third wave, this is a reference to Alvin Toffler, uh, the third wave on the beach uh, is usually the biggest and most uh, powerful one. So I'm saying that right now we are in that wave and, and it's an exciting time to be in, be in it. It's also been exciting to have seen these waves um, that came before it and hopefully be able to share that with you so that you can make your own disruptions. So, you know, it used to be that people would say, ah, oh, that technology would take maybe 50 years or 100 years. And, you know, I decided to kind of play, uh, play a little bit on this. Um, for those of you who are good with binary, it, it's not 111 decimal, but I call it 111 base 2, which is actually seven years. No computer scientists here, so electrical engineers. Okay, so in, in my view, it's, it's not a hundred years for things to come. And I, in my observations, it's only taken about less than a decade. And, and there's some evidence to kind of suggest that that's what's happening. Uh, Ray Kurzweil has talked about this countdown to the singularity, where he's saying that the time between disruptive things is becoming shorter and shorter. And one example he kind of gives, he compares, you know, uh, the origin of life to cells being billions of years to only 14 years between the PC and the World Wide Web. That's just one example. This chart by Hans Merovic um, shows the amount of computation power you can buy with uh, $1,000. So if you look at 1000 over here and map it down, yes, a little bit after 2005, you could get computation power on the level of a lizard. And so it's, it's not too far off by when we'll actually have computational power at the level of primates. So something here is happening, and I also call it the zettabyte phase. Okay, 2000, I think 12 is when Cisco said that all internet, internet traffic has surpassed the zettabyte phase. Okay, this is 250 billion worth of DVDs. Okay. Uh, this is another kind of tongue-in-cheek uh, chart that I like to show. Uh, I know it's a little hard to see, but here's the website. And, and it talks about the, the extinction of technologies. And so, for example, on this arrow right here, you know, around 2014, they predict getting lost is going to be extinct. Okay? And, and, you know, there's some other things like the floppy drive, that went extinct, the VHS tapes, that went extinct. Okay, um, you know things like hey, you know, 2019 libraries because everything's going to be online. Your traditional idea of library might go extinct. Copyrights, you know, I didn't make this up. This is this is kind of what they kind of put out on that website. But I found this kind of funny. 2050 ugliness, <laughs> and even death might might be extinct. Okay, I usually get a chuckle when when I, I highlight that. But, you know, there's some things that are kind of uh, out there. Um, for example, we all know about the movie Avatar, uh, but in fact, the, the Department of Defense is actually engaged in, in research projects to try to have this uh, embodiment uh, that goes beyond you know, your, your physical morphology. Uh, the other thing was this DARPA robotics challenge that Dean Hughes kind of alluded to. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But it's really pushing these technologies, and I believe that you know this idea of seven, seven years, 
is going to be quite uh, something to think about. Okay. Uh, an another thing I think that makes things a little confusing is what I call the erosion of boundaries. Now, for example, uh, it's unclear these days if you're paying for a product or, or a service, right? And, and cell phone is, is a classic example of that. In social media, we, we sometimes consume it, so we're users, but often we're producers of it as well. Um, many people think of Amazon as just a book company, uh, but you know, it is the one company that Google is quite scared of because Amazon is an information company and so they make that effort to scan all, all the books out there. Uh, Walmart, yeah, believe it or not, the store that you go to to get your, your supplies uh, has perhaps the most sophisticated uh, geo-navigational system out there. Any kind of outbreak of a, of a flu uh, realigns, redirects all, these, all the global supply uh, chain management to deliver those, the, the aspirin, the Kleenexes to these stores. Um, these are just some maybe familiar quotes that have been said over, over the years. Uh, if you're very quick with the mental arithmetic, what you're seeing is the difference between these times getting shorter and shorter. So that I think futurologists are having a very hard time being able to predict what's going to happen in, let's say, the next 20 years. Because they could very quickly be disproven. Okay. Um, so, you know, I think it's important to think about what's going to happen in, in the next seven years. Uh, I have a, uh, you know, we have what we call senior send-off. And I often have a chance uh, to talk to the seniors as they're beginning to commence and to, to leave our campus. And I tell them that there's a generation gap. And they look at me and I say, yeah, you're old. Right? Right? But then I say, no, no, you have a generation gap with the freshmen. Okay? And, and my colleagues here, if you're teaching freshman design, you can do this experiment too. Uh, I asked uh, the seniors, what search engine do you use? Okay. And they looked at me like I'm from another planet, and they say, of course, it's Google. Okay. And I go, yeah, you're, you're old, because I just pulled the freshman class, and their answer is not Google, it's YouTube. Okay. I, I don't know why. Um, Maybe there, it's something about they rather watch things than read things. I, I, I don't know that, but you could try that experiment. I asked the seniors, what social media do you use? Again, they look at me a little bewildered and they said, oh, Facebook. So the, you know, that's not what the freshmen are telling me. They're using Instagram. So even though they're biologically only different in four years, what technologies they're used to could be generations apart. So this is what I mean by zettabyte phase. This is what I mean by disruption. OK, so you know, I've been here for a little bit over 13 years. And as I kind of glance back at, at what I've done, um, I always thought it was somehow taking my curiosities of things and how they've led to societal impacts. And there were three things uh, that had a watershed moment in, in, in my time here at Drexel. And you can kind of guess them. Uh, the first one was 9-11, uh, then there was Hur Hurricane Katrina, and then there was my time at Boeing. Okay, and I'll discuss that a little bit. So, you know, after 9-11, uh, uh, I was, uh, you know, it, it was a really, um, if you could think back, um, there were a lot of students, um, some of them enlisted, um, but a lot were asking the question of, of what they can do. And, uh, you know, the students approached me and said, was there any way we could use robotic technologies um, to, to make a difference? And then we had a conversation uh, with Amtrak. And if you also remember at that time, there was um, this biocontaminant scare, the anthrax, things like that. And their concern was if those bioagents were released on the trains, especially if they go from Washington all the way up to Boston, and then, you know, these infections are spread out to their neighborhoods. With 25% of U.S. population being here in the Northeast, you could quickly cripple the nation. 
And so at that time, we were looking at how could we use, um, you know, cameras that might be flying because of news, uh, news agencies. There might be cameras within the building. That how could you take that information and uh, provide situational awareness, uh, both rapidly uh, vertical and horizontal, up the chain of you know, decisions and across the first responders. And you can kind of see, you know, this was a Palm Pilot, okay? It, you know, it was an old PDA at the time. But this is kind of what started our lab in, in trying to make some sort of impact. Okay? Uh, that, that following summer, I, I spent time at, uh, in Pasadena, and uh, they were using my computer vision background. What they wanted to do was to take these new uh, aircraft, they called unmanned air vehicles at the time, and see if they can land on the side of a, of a roof so that they could provide situational awareness. Okay? Uh, they were also interested in this, of course, in trying to land uh, uh, spacecraft onto meteorites and asteroids where there is no GPS in outer space. So how could you use computer vision techniques to do that? So, you know, I came back after the summer and I wanted to continue this work, but, um, you know, I said, it's the fall, it's going to be winter soon, um, I'm not going to be able to fly uh, aircraft outdoors. Uh, but I was walking around in 30th Street Station and I was saying, well, you know, I see these pigeons flying around here, can't we make aircraft fly in here? Okay? And at that time, there was very little data on how to design aircraft that fly extremely slowly. We understand how to do airfoil design at high speeds, but not at really slow speeds. Okay? So this is why you know, I, I came up with this idea that we need to capture that data, and I proposed this test rig. Okay? This was also about a time where, you know, um, in 2001, uh, Congress had issued this bill that said by 2010, one-third of all the aircraft are to be unmanned. Okay? And, and it, Looking back, it looks like this is being realized. You're, you see these familiar aircraft like the Predator and the Global Hawk. But for me, I said that search and rescue work, it's happening, uh, be it in a forest or in and around buildings and possibly in caves and tunnels. Okay? So we can't fly these type of aircraft in, in these areas. What we need to do is create something smaller but it's even more challenging because you have probably very poor GPS, very little communications, and there's a bunch of obstacles. So this was kind of the framework of what I was trying to, you know, preach out there as an area that we should look at. Okay? And so, you know, I put together, you know, this concept video. And I said 2010. Yeah, I made this in 2003. <laughs> so I wasn't trying to be, you know, overly dramatic, especially in the wake of 9/11. But be it an industrial or a natural catastrophe, and or God forbid, a terrorist one. Uh, how do you want to keep people from harm's way? So in this notional concept that I had is that, okay, you would have these UAVs, uh, they would go out in what we call forward area coverage, um, they'd be probably scoping the area to see what casualties might be there. Uh, they would have these sensors to be able to detect uh, who needs priority treatment. And then you could possibly have these, uh, this information fed to ground robots. And this is this idea of multi-robot collaboration. You might have this marsupial small one that could detect vitals and deliver treatment. And of course, you know, the most important thing is to be able to bring these people back home. Okay. 
So, like I said, this is what was coming up in 2003, and as I was showing this to people, they said, this is science fiction, this is crazy. But those people that are in this audience, you could probably recognize that all this technology exists today, and it's existed for a number of years already. This is not science fiction. Okay? So, you know, again, I have colleagues here. I wrote a proposal, that's what professors do. And I'm trying to be transparent to you. This is the panel summary. Uh, I underline it. The panel was not convinced that low speed indoor flight was possible with an aircraft that could Thomas navigate. In other words, they were saying I was crazy. <laughs> and of course, it got declined. Okay. Um, well, you know, nothing like that to have a challenge. Um, so, you know, I want to prove that, yes, you can design low-speed aircraft. Um, and that's something, of course, we all know now. You could probably even get it at your local Radio Shack or Toys R Us. But back in 2003, the idea of making aircraft extremely light, small, was unheard of. Okay? Um, this is a computer mouse. Um, Today's computer mouse all have that red LED, right? That's called an optic flow chip. Before then, uh, there was a mouse with a little rubber ball on it. Okay, but back in 2003, the optic flow chips had just come out. This is I cannibalized it to get the chip. If I could put it in the nose and on the belly, I could use optic flow to do obstacle avoidance and altitude regulation. Okay, this video that I just played was depending on an obstacle, we're going to do what we call bang-bang control, you know, turn left if you see something. This is an example that we did with one of my partners. We launched this aircraft into a cul-de-sac of trees and optic flow and said, okay, I'll keep on turning until uh, you don't have any more obstacles. So it almost seems to kind of validate what insect biologists have called, you know, optic flow. And this is what the honeybee uses to navigate, okay? So, you know, I wrote a proposal again with this, this data, and it was only about six months afterwards, and I like this one, okay? I agree that out-of-the-box proposal topic is an exciting area, okay? Uh, there's still concern, okay? But it's worth pursuing. Okay, and, and it was awarded, and it was highly competitive. I don't know what the lesson is. Maybe I think it's about time, okay, persistence. But it's interesting how in only six months, the views can change. So with that um, work that started about 2003-ish, um, I have been able to carry this out, uh, ask bigger questions. How do we get UAVs to do these much more complex tasks? Okay. Especially, how do you land you know, with, the, with the presence of fog and, and brownouts because of kicked up sand? Okay. Uh, I led a number of workshops um, that brought a lot of stakeholders uh, to the game. Um, I started to work with some of my small businesses in developing uh, autonomous cargo transport with the Chinook, as well as to create flying Metacraft uh, vehicles. Okay, so, you know, th those were things that's called dual-use technologies. We also deployed this in Hurricane Katrina. Some of my students went out there to do post-hurricane uh, mitigation. Uh, the third watershed moment was when I was invited um, to the Boeing Enterprise um, to spend a summer. Okay? And uh, I thought it was because of all this dual-use UAV work that I was doing. But I learned that they, they selected me because of my international background. In other words, I had spent time abroad uh, in Korea. Uh, I did graduate school there. Um, they said that because Boeing is a global company, and the fact was that this is a big issue for our schools. Okay. What I learned was that, sorry, Less than 3% of American science and engineering students spend any significant time abroad, uh, you know, excluding tourist travel. Okay? 
But by comparison, over 50% of European and Asian st students leave their continents. I'm not talking about a French student going to Spain. I'm talking about them going to South America, okay, or a Japanese student that's going uh, to Germany. Okay? And I made the mistake uh, in my report out to Boeing, and I called Boeing an American company. The vice president stood up and says, no, Dr. O, Boeing is a global company. Okay? And I, I thought, oh, this is just semantics. Okay? <laughs> Uh, I made the same mistake when I was in Korea talking to Samsung Electronics. I called it a Korean company, and they said, no, 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 Samsung is a multinational company. So I think there's much more than just semantics. And in fact, that's what we're seeing. Uh, the National Academies have said that we really need to equip American science and engineering students with global skills. Okay. So this also happened that the National Science Foundation had set up a very large program called Partnership for International Research and Education. And I, I felt that this was something very important. But there's no way that I could get like an aircraft in, in, into Drexel to study global design. But I said, you know what? Maybe we could use one of these, a humanoid. Okay? And the idea was, OK, humanoids also have challenges of power systems, control, computation. And the fact is that in Asia, they are the world leaders in the electromechanical design of humanoids. Okay? But I contested that America still has number one leadership when it comes to artificial intelligence and information technologies. So through the Pyre grant, I wanted to bring this marriage together so that we could rapidly um, advance the field. Okay? okay, so that was kind of the idea. So in 2008, uh, I, was, I sent my first uh, two students, um, uh, Brian and, and RJ. Uh, this was their first time um, out of the United States. Um, I've had other co-op students. It was their first time out of Pennsylvania. Okay? They haven't even gone to New York City in their life. So for them to make this leap to go completely you know, across the oceans to Korea, was something that was very brave. But the idea was, hey, I get to work on a humanoid, which is like the formula race car of robotics, was enough for them to overcome their fear and to be able to work on a world-class project. Okay. So you know, part of the deal was, OK, you go for your six-month co-op. I pay for your round-trip airfare. I give you a 10K salary, and you do work. So for example, some of the things they did was like a complete CAD model of the humanoid. Uh, they also were the agents of knowledge transfer. They took the software that we developed and implemented on the humanoid. Okay. Um, we got the humanoid here at Drexel. Um, we also kicked it off with a world debut at the Police Touch Museum. Um, I only play this video just because I wanted to show you something that was kind of interesting. Okay, watch this. Okay, the kid's pushing the robot. Okay. And this is, it kind of made me learn something. Okay, I, I've had to give demonstrations to, you know, five-star generals, captains of industry. But the audience that I scared of the most is like the eight-year-old kid. Okay? Uh, without any prompting, they just decide to push things, uh, kick the leg just to see, you know, if it could stand. And what was also historic about our demonstration is that we did not separate the public from the robot. We brought the audience on stage with the robot. For those of you who know about humanoids, Honda Asimo, you will see rarely, almost never, engagement of the humanoid with people. I understand Honda's concern, liabilities, and things like that. But my philosophy is that I don't want the technology to be scary. And it's important that they interact with the robot. And because of this lesson, it really taught me to start to think about social, human humanoid interaction and making sure that safety is a concern. Okay. 
So the PIR, you know, is a five-year project. I'm happy to say uh, it is one of NSF's uh, national role models. Uh, they point to our project. We've logged over five person years. Um, that was through the help of sending 10 co-op students to Korea, each one of them spending six months there. Uh, we spun out a lot of things. Some of you might be familiar with the Darwin uh, miniature humanoid. Uh, that came out around 2009 as a product. Uh, that was a direct outcome of our project. Uh, we called it Mini Hubo. It was transformed into a product. Uh, again, thanks to our co-ops uh, that divide, developed um, the CAD models, the operation manuals, uh, that KAIST was able to turn this uh, humanoid into a product. And Drexel was one of the first customers, and, and we acquired six of them. Okay? So these are just things of the transformative research examples that are leading to new products and new services because of research effort. So, you know, another thing is that, you know, my colleagues in robotics says, you know, hey, Paul, like, you know, you're a UAV guy. You were the leader of the field. You know, you're far ahead of everybody else. Why are you doing humanoids? And, you know, I told them, well, it's, you know, educating and training our students to be international, um, you know, global workforce is important. But what I also started to tell people was that humanoids and UAVs are very similar. And again, they looked stunned. They said, what are you talking about? Uh, the things in working in humanoids is when you start doing manipulation, for example, carrying things or pushing or even trying to drive, you start to have uh, a destabilizing effect. Okay? And in my view of UAVs, the idea was that every single science fiction flying robot I've seen, they have arms. And those arms are doing something. So, you know, this concept video, you know, I have it arms, and maybe it's doing bridge repair, okay? And if you start putting arms on these flying aircraft, the dynamics are very, very similar to humanoids. The rule with humanoids is never fall down. The rule with the aircraft is never crash. Mathematically, you can contextualize it to be very similar, okay? So this is the kind of project that I've been working on. It has impacts as well, because space robots are also six degree of freedom, just like aircraft. And same thing with underwater robots. Okay? Yeah, of course, the Reynolds numbers are all different and, and that. But this idea of being able to physically interact with your environment, with these flying, swimming, spatial aircraft, uh, is something of interest. And this is what I've been promoting uh, most recently. You know, people thought it was kind of crazy, um, but, you know, thankfully, you know, we got some awards. This is the idea of mobile manipulating UAVs. And also now we recently got this NRI large to look at human-humanoid collaborative transportation. The mathematics are very, very similar. Okay, okay so I'm going to segue into uh, the DARPA Robotics Challenge. Okay, this is the project that's been consuming um, our life for the past uh, 13 months. Just a show of hands, how many people have heard of the DRC? Okay, maybe about 60%. Okay. And if you, you, know, you ask people what the DRC is, okay, uh, you know, it, was, it was officially kicked off in October of last year, and, and it lit up the blogosphere. Okay. Uh, it, it did so domestically, it also did it across the, you know, in other countries. And these were just some of the headlines. Things like, oh, it's a $2 million competition. Okay? Others said, oh, it's disaster-ready robot. Okay? But you know, when I explain it to my mother, you know, I say, uh, this is the biggest show in robotics history. And this will change our world. Okay? So that's kind of the takeaway I'm hoping that you'll get from this, that the DRC will change our world. Okay. Why the DRC? Okay. Uh, because of the tsunami that helped and that, that happened in Japan in 2011, the tragic thing was that if you could have just simply turned off the valve or flick a switch or attach a hose, a lot of the uh, catastrophe that came after could have 
been averted or at least mitigated. Okay. Um, for Japan, this was almost a, kind of a, a time of reflection. Uh, they've been doing robots for over three decades, and the Japanese start to ask, where were they when they needed them the most? So DARPA decided that understanding, you know, the, the level of technology at that time, that maybe we needed uh, something to catalyze things. And so they created this challenge for a robot to do eight things. And just to make it a little bit easy for you to understand, um, you know, we put together this concept video. Okay, now I'm saying seven years from now, year 2020. So in the DRC, the robot for event one must drive a vehicle, unmodified vehicle. We're not talking unmanned driverless vehicle, it's a regular vehicle. Okay. You have to understand this might be a biocontaminated, radiated area. You don't want to send people there. It might be devastated, so there might be debris. So event two demands that it walk on rugged terrain. Event three said there might be debris in front of the door, so remove it. Open these doors. Walls might be breached. So we're supposed to use a tool. And we gotta break through it. Okay. Next thing is we have to climb a ladder. We gotta find this valve and turn it. And we might have to attach a hose or replace a pump. Okay? So I'm showing you this video. How many people think that we could do this by the year 2020? Oh, okay, I have some more believers, okay? Remember I showed you that first video, we said we got the UAVs, or people say you're crazy, okay? But less than seven years that was realized. I believe within less than seven years that this will be realized as well, okay? Why a $2 million prize? Okay, again, this comes from the Office of Science and Technology Policy. It's about increasing the awareness and catalyzing development, okay? These are some of the characteristics of a grand challenge. Okay. Grand challenges are nothing new. Um, in fact, you know, back in 1714, they called it the Longitudinal Longitude Prize. Uh, there was another one that was Napoleon issued for food preservation, um, as well as uh, Charles Lindbergh crossing the Atlantic. So this idea of having a cash prize is, is nothing new. It just builds a lot of excitement and really pushes people to focus on the problem. The uh, real epitome of the grand challenges are the DARPA ones, okay? And back in 2004, this was the race to the desert that Stanford had won. Uh, it was followed by the urban challenge uh, that uh, was driverless technologies in the city, okay? In less than seven years today, we have three states that have legalized driverless cars, less than, less than seven years. And in fact, um, for those that can afford it, the very high-end BMWs have a lot of these driverless technologies as options. Okay. So true to the DARPA model of grand challenges, it's to be disruptive and transformative, and therefore it has big impact. 
how do they do this DRC is quite, uh, quite an event. Okay? To simplify things for you, basically there's two ways to look at it. Okay? You have these four tracks. One way is that there are tracks that have to build the robot, they have to build the software, they have to build everything. Okay? There's another track where, hey, you just have to do software and DARPA will give you a robot. Another way of breaking it up is teams that this DARPA decided to give money to, and then there are teams that have said, hey, we don't need DARPA money, we're doing it ourselves. Probably because of intellectual property issues. Okay, so back in October, 18 teams were announced. Um, July, we had something called a critical design review. Also, the software teams had a virtual robot competition. Uh, it whittled down the number to 13. And this December, uh, we all compete, and the top eight will then go to the finals in 2014, where the winner will get the $2 million prize. So who was selected for the uh, DRC? You know, these are track A, the, the ones that have to build their own robot. And you know, we have JPL, Johnson's, uh, Raytheon, CMU, Virginia Tech, and Drexel. Hot for Drexel, right? <laughs> uh, these were all the teams that just developed software, and the best teams um, that performed there DARPA would give them this $1.2 million robot called Atlas. Okay. It's a 300 pound, uh, six foot towering robot. Uh, the teams would be given this. Okay. So like I said, in July, they competed. We went through critical design review. Uh, basically, it whittled down the field. And Drexel's still here, so we're good. What does the DRC mean for Drexel? Um, I think it's, it's epic. Uh, it's, Drexel is center stage with this. Uh, this is a highly anticipated event within the community uh, in robotics. Uh, Drexel is in, in the world spotlight. I believe it will be transformative. The outcomes of these technologies will be having the same impact the driverless cars did. Okay? Uh, I, I believe it's a game changer for, for our institution. Uh, it also is historic. Uh, Drexel's not uh, participated in grand challenges before. It is endorsement by the Department of Defense of being uh, a best of the best performer. It is catalytic uh, because of CMU and, and, and their victories. This has led to huge amount of industrial support, uh, the intellectual property transfer, alumni gifting. Um, and I really believe that uh, Drexel can win this $2 million ch challenge. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I think winning, it means everything to us. There, there is no second or third place. Uh, I don't want this to be a footnote in, in somewhere. Uh, I want Drexel to be recognized for, for its leadership. Okay. I think it, it reinforces our co-op brand of education and our ideas of use-inspired research. But well, what, what are we up against? Okay. In, in many ways, I call us the Rocky team. Okay. Um, we're up against Goliaths like, like NASA and, and, and billion dollar defense contractors. Okay. But I think we have a strategy that could actually uh, win this. Okay. Uh, what I really do need from the rest of the Drexel community is if you could spread the word about our effort. Um, I actually have some brochures, um, and I understand that the Miami finals will be webcast, and I believe President Fry's office is trying to arrange uh, a PEP group to go down with us. Okay, so this is kind of phenomenal. Uh, this is what happens when you have the Department of Defense budget. They rented out the entire NASCAR facility at Miami. Okay. Uh, this is where uh, they plan to have all the team garages. Okay, this is where all the disaster mock-up is going to be. Uh, they imagine this being filled with the spectators. This is where the pit crew is going to be. Uh, it's going to be public. It's webcast. Uh, government VIPs, of course. 
More importantly, NOVA and National Geographic are going to be filming this to create an IMAX 3D documentary on this. So this is big, and this is what DARPA does. Okay, okay so you know, I asked myself, why am I doing this DRC? And uh, I remember uh, when I first heard about it, that I said, whoever does this is crazy. How do you do these eight events? Drive a car? Climb a ladder? You really had to be a Goliath, okay? You've had to have decades of well-financed infrastructure with, you know, multi-million dollars of support and legions of engineers if you're going to do this event. But I remember waking up the next morning really compelled to do this, okay? I mean, not only was it about a, a noble effort, this idea of disaster response and humanitarian assistance, but moreover, you know, it's of course transformative and disruptive, but I felt I owed it to my students, okay, to participate in something meaningful that is bigger and, and more powerful than any individual. And so I said, just like you know, how David you know, was tactical and agile, I took stock and I said, you know what, we have seven of these humanoids at Drexel. How can we be Goliath? Okay. So I decided to take what I call a divide and conquer approach. Okay. I got on the phone, I started to talk to a lot of collaborators and trusted people that I have in the community. And um, I assembled this band of brothers. And the idea was that you would get a Hubo humanoid and you just work on one event. Don't try to tackle all eight. Just focus on ladder climbing. You focus on um, the, the, the driving of the car. And this is how we distributed the robots. And the idea was to develop the, the software in parallel. Okay. And so just to give you an idea of how that approach has been working for us, while most of the teams were busy trying to build something, we Drexel quickly deployed all the software simulators that we designed to our partners. And here they're actually trying to implement you know, their expertise on this. And then we also shipped out the Hugo humanoids, we gave them training. And here, you know, they're uh, trying to apply their approaches. But, you know, they're starting to realize that some things work, some things don't. Uh, for example, maybe the legs are not long enough. Uh, the torso might not really have that range of motion. And maybe even the hands might not be strong enough. But this is stuff that we all knew, okay? But we created the wish list and we told our partner in Korea what needs to be updated. So within about a month, they created a new CAD model for us. And we start to realize, yeah, this, these extra degrees of freedom, um, the, the changes in the size might be able to pull this off. And we called it the, the beta DRC Hubo. So they took that in Korea, they actually took those things and they started to brass board the designs. They made much stronger hands. Uh, they uh, implemented some of our algorithms. And most importantly was the idea that we could rapidly upgrade our existing humanoids. And this is also a command and control center that we built at Drexel, it's in the armory. And we also built a mock disaster scene. If you ever go to the Army, you can actually see it. Okay. okay. Now, another thing that we did as, as a David approach is that summer is a great time for students. You know, they don't have classes. Okay. So thanks to Drexel, we, we secured the dorms. Okay. And for 10 weeks, uh, they consumed the armory. Uh, they ate together. They lodged together, they took over classrooms, they were sharing code, 
They were pulling all-nighters. And it really was a time for us as a team to, to, to build morale. And these are just some of the outcomes. This is, uh, you just saw the humanoid driving our surrogate vehicle. It was the golf cart. This is the darker vehicle that we must use. It's a Polaris utility vehicle. Uh, here we are actually implementing the rough terrain walking. So we're slowly coming together on this. And these are the outcomes of the summer. Here we are climbing the ladders and turning the valves and working on the fire hoses. Right now, my team is engaged. We are pretending we are at Miami. We are doing mock trials. We do this to get performance statistics. We want to know how many points we can get on the scoreboard when we go to Miami. This is the grading chart that DARPA will be using. The 65 days, well now we're about 50 days left. Here we are still continuing to work on driving. This is amazing. Our partners in Indiana are teleoperating the robot over the internet or the robots in Philadelphia. This is doing it out of Worcester. And this is a humanoid that's also at Georgia Tech. The Georgia Tech crew is, is, is working on it there. And this is our hose attack. Okay, another thing is that DARPA wants to create this like to be like March Madness. They want you to amp it up. They really want people to get excited. So they asked us to personify robots. Okay, each team has to personify it. And I said, you know what? Hey, we're Philadelphia, Rocky, underdog. This is iconic, okay? And Miami for us is kind of like our Cinderella story, okay? And so, you know, th that's the theme I'm going with. And those in robotics who recognize this is Boston Dynamics, they, they, these went viral on YouTube. But we're showing our Hugo can kind of do our own stuff. This just was released in early October. This went viral. We did this a couple of weeks afterwards. This is iconic. This is ours. <laughs> okay. But again, what I'd like to talk about, you know, as cool as building robots are, uh, that's not why we're doing this. Or at least that's not why I'm doing it. It's, it's much greater than that. It, it, to me, it's about disaster response. And I think our students talk about it the most. So that's what, you know, gives me the most uh, sense of uh, pride and joy. <coughs> See our students in the, the all-nighters, the blood, sweat, and tears that they're pouring into this. It's not just about building another robot. It, it's about 
making a difference. Um, I'll also skip this slide. I realize I'm running out of time. But I just wanted to kind of leave with you the things that I think have been about being tipping points and disruptive. And I call it the four E's. I think the students who know me, I always talk four E's. It's about really responding to needs, encouraging your community by having a vision and having a why about why you're doing what you're doing, and then creating disruptive tools to make a meaningful difference. And you know, at that, I just want to again acknowledge uh, my sponsors. And if my students are here, if you could just stand, um, I'd like to give them a thanks. Okay. Wish us all the best in Miami. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. So, as I understand it, then you actually have to make the robot. So you're showing us prototypes, but you have to assemble, or you're going to have them done in Korea. So yes, we actually have the robots. You saw that we had seven. Those were Hubo Pluses. Uh, but you also saw that they were not sufficient to do the task of the DRC. And so we retrofitted them to make them bigger and stronger. But you're not allowed to have them made for you in your career, right? No, absolutely not. There is no restriction like this. We are an international team. We are global. <laughs> <laughs> sure, to get tickets, there's no tickets needed, it's open to the public, um, and I think uh, the provost's office, as well as the board of trustees, is going to try to arrange something, so maybe it'll be a bus, but uh, it's Miami in December, is not a hard sell. <laughs> okay, well there's no more questions, thank all one time for coming Uh, and for those in the audience, remember it's Halloween, some unusual activities.